Good evening, everybody. It's exactly 7.01 p.m. here in Kitchener, Ontario. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Fontaine, Pro Technical Services Veterinarian at Royal Canin Canada, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague, Dr. Rick Kessler from Royal Canin U.S. Rick, are you there? I'm here. Welcome to everybody. Hope you enjoy it. We had a great uh, first webinar today. So guys, we are really excited to give you this second session on puppy diarrhea, new pathogens on the blog, and we're going to start right now, and we are going to welcome you to, because this is the first canine dog breeder webinar we give this year, we have a little surprise for you. So let's do this. Oh, interesting. My surprise didn't work. Come on. Let's do that again. So, computer checked, internet connection checked, PowerPoint checked. I think we're ready, Godzi. Let's do this. Okay, so this time it worked. Fantastic. Thank you again, guys. Hello, everyone. It is really our pleasure to welcome you on this first dog breeder webinar of 2017. You know, we, we had great discussions last year and this. Uh, early today, and I can tell you that Dr. Kessler and I, we are really eager to, to kick off this new webinar year. And you know, for, for this season opening, we picked a topic that raises lots of questions from you guys, diarrhea in puppies. So without further ado, let's dig in, because you guys know Dr. Kessler and I can definitely be quite talkative. And uh, Dr. Kessler, do you remember July of 2016? Barely, but I do, Dr. Emmanuel. <laughs> Come on. Warm weather, long days, sunny days. And remember, we were online on, uh, in a similar virtual conference room giving a webinar, uh, those things you like so much. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys were there too, listening to our English and Franklish mix, you know. The, the webinar we gave at this time was this one. It was titled, 10 Things You Need to Tell Your New Puppy Owner. If you missed it, by the way, keep in mind that you can still watch them. They are all online. But this webinar was interesting because during this webinar, we asked you the following question. What is the most common problem seen in puppies in veterinary clinics? You know, it turned out to be a very interesting question, you know, uh, because, in fact, when we look at the canine big data studies like Benfield State of Health, Skin disorders, in fact, are definitely the most common di problem diagnosed in puppies. However, you know, when we asked you guys, dog breeders, the question, the most common answer we got was gastroenteritis, GI problems. And you know, that is something Dr. Kessler and I were not surprised to hear. That was the first thing we had in mind, too, before even looking at the big data studies. I mean, we work with dog breeders on a daily basis. We know how specific and different those environments can be. And while skin disorders seem to be the most common cause of consultation in privately owned puppies, when it comes to breeding kennels, GI disorders in puppies must be on every breeder's mind. We have no doubt about that. So they are frequent. They can be deadly, as you know. No doubt you need to stay up to date on this. So during this webinar today, to illustrate what we're going to show you, we wanted to follow three liters of puppies. So it's kind of interesting because my slides are moving by themselves, but you can see the first liter of puppies we're going to follow, a liter of five-week-old Rottweiler puppies. We will also follow a liter of seven-week-old Yorkie puppies, and we will also follow 
a litter of four-week-old Brittany Spaniels. What they have in common? They were born, all of them, at their breeder's kennel. And all of them, all of those litters are currently experiencing diarrhea issues. So they are owners, dog breeders like you guys. They are looking for answers. And as we go through this presentation, we will try to provide you with as many of them as possible. So it's time to pause the Franklish part for a bit and hand the virtual floor over to Dr. Kessler so that he can tell you more about those stories. So Dr. Kessler, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Fontaine, and welcome to everyone once again. Um, for the second webinar, I'm still unable to see that first video, so everybody seems to be enjoying it, so hopefully in a little bit later I'll be able to enjoy it also. So we're going to start this uh, webinar um, with a question for you all. And, and the one thing that you're going to find out is we have a whole bunch of poll questions for you. So please feel free to participate. And the first one is, when is it more frequent to observe diary in puppies? Basically, do we see it more often in two to three week old puppies, four to eight week old puppies, and then four to five month old, or eight to 10 month old? So take a few seconds and answer this, and. Uh, We'll just step right back in when we get the results. All right. A few more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. So let's go to the results. Okay, so the majority of you all said four to eight weeks, and I think Dr. Fontaine and I would totally agree with that. Clinical signs will typically show up between the four and eight weeks of age. Um, that is the age of the three litters of puppies that we are going to follow in this webinar. And one thing that we can tell you is that clinical signs will undoubtedly vary a lot. We will see diarrhea for sure. We will eventually see vomiting. We will see mild diarrhea. We can see profuse diarrhea. And we can see severe hemorrhagic diarrhea. So after our first poll question, um, I have another question for you that I would like for you to answer on the chat. And basically, can you tell me on the chat why this is so frequent at this specific age? So give me your thoughts on why we see diarrhea at this age more often than any other. Weaning, diet changes, weaning again, parvo, parasites, okay. Introducing food, parasites again, those are all good ones. Changes of home, stress. Okay, all those are good answers. Bacteria. So let's go through the top three that uh, we believe um, that you all need to understand. And, and basically the first one is um, something that we call the immunity gap. So to make uh, the definition of it super short, Puppies receive the first immunity after drinking the colostrum of their mother. You all know that. And this transit immunity will progressively wane off about four to eight weeks. So during this immunity gap, the puppies are no more protected by those remaining antibodies from the mother. And those antibodies will now interfere with the vaccination process. So they cannot be properly immunized. So they are definitely at risk here for sure. The next one I think that we would like for you to understand is the kennel. Because of the environment they are living in, no matter how clean your kennel is, and I have a saying that basically is a clean kennel is not disinfected, but a disinfected kennel is clean, the risk of encountering digestive pathogens will always be higher in this type of environment. So those pathogens are commonly found in kennels, and if you have several dogs, basically we will see more pathogens. So it is a reality that we know that you are aware of. And the next is the weaning process, okay? Because of the fact that they are going through nutritional weaning at the same time, their digestive tract is evolving. And during this period, they will progressively move from milk to solid food. This means behavioral modifications. They will move from nursing, then licking, to chewing food. They have anatomic modifications during this time. They have enzymatic modifications at this time. So their digestive tract is definitely fragile 
and at the same time they are predisposed to infectious diseases and live in environments surrounded by pathogens. That is the reason why you will often hear the term weaning diarrhea. So if we were to ask our three breeders here, they will tell you the Rottweiler litter, the Yorkie litter, the Brittany litter, they are all currently going through nutritional weaning. And when it comes to weaning diarrhea, we often refer to it as a syndrome. There are several potential causes, including infectious, nutritional, environmental. So what we can say right now, it is a complex disease to deal with. It is definitely multifactorial, the pathogens, the environment, the nutrition. Those are the three aspects that always need to be considered together when we approach this problem and are trying to find a solution. So today we focus on the infectious causes, but you will see with this syndrome, it always comes back to focusing on all three aspects. So let's go back to our three litters that we are following. So obviously the first litter that we're going to talk about are our Rottweiler puppies. So the Rottweiler puppies, they're lethargic, they have a smelly, and profuse hemorrhagic diarrhea. So the question that I'm going to ask you is what is the most probable cause in this situation? Would it be parvo? Would it be coronavirus? Giardia or coccidia? So take a few seconds and, and answer that. <clears throat> we'll wait and get a few more responses. Come on, everybody, kick in and uh, give us an answer here. We'll give you a few more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. So let's go to the results. Just like in the last webinar, coccidia infection came in number one. Um, indeed, this is not the answer that we were looking for. In this case, with the Rottweiler puppies, we believe that the right answer and the definitely invocative of parvovirus. Okay, so this is the most classic description of parvovirus that you will find. So an important point, we know for sure that today this clinical expression, the one that we just talked about, does not always mean parvo. That stinky odor of the diarrhea, and some people tell us it smells like death, does not give us a diagnosis. It tells us it is a severe problem that needs to be immediately taken care of for sure, but it just indicates the gravity of the disease. You could find the same thing with any other digestive pathogen when things get ugly. So even if we know today that this clinical expression does not always mean parvo, this is the pathogen you should always have in mind when you breed dogs when it comes to weaning diarrhea and puppies. What you need to know is that it is not a disease from the past, like we sometimes hear. Parvo is still the number one viral cause of weaning diarrhea in puppies. So what you need to know is that it's a new virus that is resistant in the environment. Transmission can occur between puppies, but if the virus is present in the environment, puppies can definitely be infected. If you remember the last dog breeder webinar we gave last year, we mentioned that there's evidence that healthy, pregnant, lactating bitches shed parvovirus and are a potential source of infection. This means that sanitation is key in terms of preventing parvovirus infection. So what you need to know is that vaccination remains the best way to prevent parvo infection. When a puppy has built an immune response against the virus, this immunity is typically strong and long-lasting. So on a side note, even if it is clear today that there are different strains of parvo, so we talk about parvo 2A, 2B, 2C, the diagnostic tests and vaccines are still equally efficient for the different strains. So let's go on now to another litter. And let's talk a little bit about what the Yorkies are experiencing. So two of them are having softer stools, they're greenish in color, and it contains a lot of mucus. So that leads to our next poll question. So according to you, what is the most probable cause in this situation? Would it be parvo, corona, Giardia infection, or co coccidia infection? We'll wait a 
a little bit longer and everybody chip in here. Looks like we got a race between Giardi and Coxidia. A few more people, then we'll, we'll go to the results. All right, let's go to the results and see uh, what our answers are. So basically, it's it's equally split between Coxidia and Giardia. Um, in this case, basically, it sounds like a Coxidia infection. It is very typical clinical description of diarrhea related to Coxidia in puppies. So Coxidia, what are they? They're protozoa that are commonly encountered in dogs. There are two main types causing diarrhea. One we call neonatal, the other weaning diarrhea. And the most frequent remains weaning diarrhea. So coccidia produce cysts that are kind of like coccidia eggs. They will be ejected in the stools and contaminate the environment. These cysts are resistant, and this is where contamination can occur in puppies. It's important to keep in mind that coccidia cysts are extremely resistant to classical dis disinfectants, and today, the best alternative for them is to consider steam cleaning. So what do we mean by steam cleaning? Temperatures above 70 degrees Celsius and basically 158 degrees Fahrenheit. And that will lead to rupture of these cysts. And an interesting point to remember, to infest a new host, coccidia cyst needs somehow to hatch. We call it sporulation. And this requires to spend two to five days in the environment. So scooping up the poop on a daily basis will definitely be an important prevention measure here. There are medical treatments available that can also be used as preventatives when the problem is considered recurrent in kennels. However, clinical signs need to be observed before coccidia can be found, even in large amounts in asymptomatic puppies. So that's important to remember, that we can have large numbers of a coccidia in asymptomatic puppies. And our next breed is the Brittany Spaniels. And they're undergoing a little bit of a problem also. They are a little bit off. Their stools are yellowish. And they have a tendency to be coprophagic. In other words, they're eating their own poop. So we have a poll question for you now. According to you, what would be the most probable cause in this situation? Would it be parvo, corona, giardia, or coccidia? All right, give you a few more seconds and then we'll go to the answer. Five, four, three, two, one. So basically it looks like Giardia won this and, and I think that Dr. Emmanuel and I would totally agree. So Giardia, like Coccidia, is a protozoa. The cysts are resistant in the environment, but on the contrary to Coccidia, they can directly infest, infect a new host as soon as they get in the environment. So remember, with coccidia, it took two to five days, not so much with giardia. So medical treatments are available, but because of this high resistance in the environment, and especially in this particular cycle, it is not always easy to fully control the problem in kennels, just with the medical treatment and sanitation measures will be required. So those three pathogens we just mentioned, parvo, giardia, coccidia, they are considered today as the most common causes of infectious diarrhea in puppies around weaning. So we just briefly discussed them, but they should always be on the top of your mind when you deal with diarrhea in your puppy. You definitely need to know them well. You also need to look for them when some of your puppies develop diarrhea in your kennels. You always want to rule them out. That's a top priority. So in the different answers, there was another infection that we talked about, and that is called canine coronavirus. So if you've ever done PCR tests, those are the tests that basically look for the DNA of the pathogen, and they come in digestive PCR panels that screen for several digestive pathogens at one time. I'm sure you've always noticed this name, coronavirus. So the poll question I have for you now is what do you think when a puppy tests positive for canine coronavirus? It's a very serious pathogen, bears no clinical significance. It's a problem only when it comes along with parvo, or it's a problem only when it comes along with giardia. Tell us what you think about that. Give you a few 
more seconds here. All right, five, four, three, two, one. So the majority of you said it's a very serious pathogen. Some of you said it's no clinical significance, and the other one has come along with parvo. So there's been lots of discussion over the years regarding the pathogenic role of um, canine coronavirus. Some authors believe it is normal host of the digester tract, while other authors consider it that it can indeed play a role in the development of weaning diarrhea, especially in association with parvo. So here is the intestinal cells are lined up in the canine digestive tract. And canine parvo typically destroys the cells that are here, the ones with the color. Okay? So basically that's important to understand. Because when we think about canine coronavirus, okay, that replicates and destroys the cells that are here. So that shows you how theoretically this combination is deadly. That being said, as I mentioned earlier, I spoke with many veterinarians who believe that canine coronavirus should not be considered as a specific pathogen. So indeed, dogs and puppies can shed canine coronavirus in the feces without showing any clinical signs whatsoever. Things, however, changed a bit after 2005. In 2005, a veterinary research group from the University of Bari in Italy reported an outbreak of severe gastroenteritis in puppies. The clinical symptoms were initially observed in three miniature schnauzers, one and a half months old, and one cocker spaniel, two months of age, and consisted of fever, 39 and a half to 40 degrees centigrade, 103, 104 Fahrenheit. They had lethargy, they weren't eating, they were vomiting, they had hemorrhagic diarrhea, and they had neurological signs such as seizures, and that followed by death after two days. The same symptoms were observed two days later in two other schnauzers and one Pekingese. So the tests that were performed did not detect the usual viruses that we mentioned until now. All the puppies turned out to be parvo negative. Necropsies were performed, and that revealed lesions of the digestive tract but also in other organs, including the lungs, liver, spleen, and brain. So they had a closer look at all those lesions in which they isolated a specific, a specific canine coronavirus called 2A, strain CB05, that was become known as the canine pantropic coronavirus. So this one is definitely worth mentioning in the presentation because it is considered to be a mutant of the canine coronavirus. While the classic canine coronavirus stays in the digestive tract, the pantropic virus spreads to other organs. Since then, it has been reported in other countries, including France, and Belgium, and Greece. And the signs that we see with it are fever, lethargy, they're not eating, vomiting, they have hemorrhagic diarrhea, their white blood cell counts are low, and they have neurological signs, again, like seizures, followed by death within two days. And that was characteristic of the severe systemic illness in the outbreaks. So when you think of it, I think we can all agree those signs would be difficult to distinguish from those of a parvovirus infection. That is already telling us one important thing for you breeders. If you unfortunately ever get in this situation, it is mandatory to reach a diagnosis. Guessing is not permitted in a breeding kennel when, when it comes to puppy diarrhea. You want to make sure you clearly identify parvo if it is involved. So you need to find out what might be causing the problem. It is important to keep in mind is that the PCR is not yet able to differentiate classic coronavirus from the pantropic version of it. So the diagnosis is very often made when coronavirus is identified in the presence of organs, showing that it has the ability to spread. So a second point of detail here that we want to talk about and leave you with is that it is definitely worth mentioning. If the worst happens, think of performing a necropsy. This is the best test that will give you all the answers. We know it is a very sad situation when this happens and a very frustrating one. In breeding kennels, however, you will need answers. This is the only way you can adapt your kennel management to better prevent the problems in the future. 
The necropsy is the only test that will give you those clear answers. I know sometimes it doesn't tell us as much as we expected. However, if it is not performed, we can only make assumptions, while what we really need here is clarity. So it is important for breeders and veterinarians to work with their laboratory to discuss what samples are needed, how and when to send these samples, and to give the pathologist as much information as you possibly can to make the diagnosis. So with this, the English part of this ends, and I thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fontaine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kessler. And indeed, it is time to turn to the Pranglish part of the presentation. And when it comes, and to start, I have a question for you guys. So Dr. Kessler presented to you guys the most common pathogens we find when it comes to weaning diarrhea in puppies. What do you think is your top priority to prevent this syndrome in your kennels? Do you need to focus on nutrition? Do you need to focus on medical treatments? Do you need to focus on stress prevention? Or do you need to focus on sanitation? So tell us, what do you think is your top priority? Okay, so five, four, three, two, one. Okay, 80% of you said sanitation. That was an easy call. I guess many of you have been attending to several of our webinars, and that's indeed what we're preaching. We, we definitely believe that sanitation is really key. Uh, but I believe that for you guys, when you need to, to, to fight an infectious disease, there's one key word you need to know, and this key word is this one. I'm going to this one, prophylaxis. So prophylaxis, what does it mean? It means treatments given or actions taken to prevent diseases. And this term, you see, encompasses all the preventive measures you will need to focus on as breeders inside your kennel. So when it comes to fighting infectious diseases, there are always two priorities in terms of prophylaxis. And this is something our tree breeder here will definitely have to, to, to think of and to, to focus on. The first thing is what we call the medical prophylaxis a.k.a. the drugs and therapeutic approaches we will use to prevent the problem from happening. When it comes to weaning diarrhea, remember the most common infectious causes, that's what Dr. Kistler just told you, they are viruses and protozoa. So medical prophylaxis is all around vaccination and deworming. But we believe it is also and mainly about you know, partnering with your veterinarian. This is clearly your veterinarian's job to, to determine what will be the best medical protocol to use for your specific kennel. Because remember that if there are some general recommendations in terms of vac vaccination, in terms of deworming, and by the way, you can find them online. Uh, you can visit a website like the WSABA, the World Small Animal Veterinarian Association, and on those websites, you will find the usual recommendations in terms of vaccinations and deworming. So even if we have usual recommendations, each kennel, each breeding kennel is different, and each kennel needs to be approached in, a, in eventually a different way. So the medical prophylaxis protocol needs to be defined based on what circulates inside your kennel, on its history. And this is where, for instance, pool fecal samples are a really interesting tool, I believe, to consider to, to better define the deworming protocol that your kennel needs, for instance. However, medical prophylaxis alone, and that's what you guys said when you answered the question, medical prophylaxis alone will never be enough. And I think that's a very important takeaway because the medical prophylaxis is only half of the kennel's prevention plan. You definitely need to focus on the other half, which is what we call sanitary prophylaxis. The sanitary prophylaxis is all about sanitation, cleaning, disinfecting. So we won't dive too much into those concepts today because we did a webinar a few years ago on this topic and the information is still relevant and it's online and you can find all the information and I will share the link with you guys on the notes. But we just wanted to remind you how important it was because nobody likes to scoop the poop. Nobody likes to daily clean and disinfect, and I'm sure we can all, all, all agree on that. But in kennels, in breeding kennels or weather, this must be your top priority. This is what you must focus your energy on. 
because the most common pathogens we mentioned, remember Dr. Kessler mentioned parvo, coccidia, gerbia, those three, they are resistant in the environment. And this is very often where puppies can be contaminated and worst case scenario can be recontaminated. You know, you treat them, they get better, but then the problem starts again just because they were recontaminated via the environment. So you should see those sanitary measures as the cornerstone of the protection of your kennel. And they will definitely work along with the medical prophylaxis established by your veterinarian. And when it comes to defining a sanitation protocol, it's a little bit like the medical uh, protocol as well. Remember that you originally always want to target two types of pathogens, protozoa and viruses. But that being said, let's go back to, to our three cases. So when weaning diarrhea happens inside a kennel, you understand now that we absolutely need to rule out those common pathogens Dr. Kessler reminded you uh, about earlier. And in those three cases, they did the test. They did some tests. They performed the test to look for those most common pathogens. But those tests didn't bring any answers. All of them came back negative. Oh, for sure, I'm sure we can say that there are lots of things that could explain why the test came back negative. Maybe something interfered, you know, with the test, and we got what we call a false negative. There are indeed inhibitors that can affect the results of the PCR, and those inhibitors, we know that there are some of them in the feces. So that's definitely a possibility to consider here. Maybe the pathogens involved were not shed when the test was performed. We know that GRD and coccidia, for instance, they have a transient excretion. So maybe when we looked for them, they were simply not in the samples that were submitted. That's also definitely a possibility. But let's imagine for a moment that we were able to overcome all those potential problems and still everything came back negative. Hmm. What do you guys think? What do you think it means? Do you think maybe they missed something? Do you think maybe it's probably, it means it's probably not infectious? Maybe it's probably a yeast infection? Or maybe it's a non-specific infection? So tell me, what do you think this means when you do all the tests and it all comes back negative? So four, five, three, two, one, okay, so most of you, 70% of you guys said, oh, the charts are moving in all directions. I love that. Uh, but most of you said it's a non-specific infection. Hmm, interesting. Very, uh, we, we'll come back to that one. That's a very good point. Uh, but the point we really wanted to make here, clearly, uh, because many, very often when this happens, people tell us, oh, it's probably not infectious. But keep one thing in mind. Negative does not mean that all infectious causes have been ruled out. Because a diagnostic test can only detect what it is meant to detect. PCRs, for instance, use what we call primers that will identify specific sequences of the pathogen's genome. However, even when you use the more exhaustive digestive PCR panels, they only contain a given number of primers. They will only look for certain pathogens. PCRs, for instance, will not detect coccidia. So far, those can only be detected via PICO test. And over the years, we learned a lot about winning diarrhea. And there are definitely some pathogens that are reported in the veterinary, veterinary literature that are known to cause winning diarrhea in puppies that our current tests do not look for. Have you guys heard of the canine norovirus. So noroviruses are, are, are a very interesting group of virus. Uh, in humans, human noroviruses are considered as a major cause of viral gastroenteritis worldwide. Typically in humans, uh, the infection starts, causes acute diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and the illness will last roughly 28 to 60 hours. Human infections by this virus is most common in healthcare institutions, like hospitals, for instance. But outbreaks are often reported in schools, restaurants, cruise ships, 
even military bases. So you see, basically, we can find those, uh, those problems in collectivities, at least in humans. And look at that. 2011, March 2011, an outbreak of acute gastroenteritis in puppies and adult dogs was described, was reported in a Portuguese kennel. After the, and this happened after the introduction of dogs imported from Russia. In this case, the identified culprit was a canine norovirus. So this pathogen can definitely cause weaning diarrhea in puppies. Have you guys heard about this one? The canine circovirus. So you see, this one made the news in 2012. And it was, in fact, identified in the U.S. Several cases were reported across the country. And it seemed to spread, honestly, like an epidemic. At least, that's what it looked like on Twitter. But dogs affected by this virus were diagnosed with what we call vasculitis, inflammation of the blood vessel, and hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. And same thing. This paper here described an outbreak in a U.S. papillion kennel. And you see the canine circovirus was involved. And it affected adult dogs, but mainly puppies around weaning. And since 2012, we've seen several reports of canine circovirus involved in weaning diarrhea. And those reports come from all over the world. And there's more. Have you heard about this one? The canine astrovirus. Astroviruses, they are very funny virus. Uh, they are small, rounded viruses with a peculiar star-shaped like, uh, or star-like shape, sorry, <laughs> when, observe, when you observe them under electron microscopy. If you ever get to play with an electron microscope, that's a fantastic tool to play with. But anyway, infection with these viruses are associated with, again, gastroenteritis in most animal species. And the human astrovirus, for instance, is regarded as the second or third, depending on the publication, most common cause of viral diarrhea in children. In 1980, astrovirus-like particles were observed in diarrhea samples taken from beagle puppies. And in 2012, this study was published by the research group of the University of Bari in Italy. Rick already mentioned them a little bit earlier, but this group is really involved in GI pathogens in puppies. And same thing, they highlighted the fact that these viruses, the canine astrovirus, could cause weaning diarrhea in puppies. And you know what, guys? The list could go on and on. on, and on. There are reports on viruses called cobuvirus. Canine cobuvirus, they were identified in dogs in the U.S. And it was the first time we, it was demonstrated that those viruses could be found in, in pets. Uh, those viruses cause diarrhea in, in, in humans, and it has been described initially in Japan. Sapovirus, same thing, with pathogens that are described to cause winning diarrhea in puppies. Boca virus, also described as a cause of winning diarrhea in puppies these days. And those are just the viruses. The list could also add some protozoa as well, like tri some tri trichomonads. So uh, there's one especially... Pantatrichomonas hominis, which has been shown to circulate in puppies diagnosed with winning diarrhea. There's at least one report of the protozoa Neospora caninum causing diarrhea in puppies as well. So you see, as years go by, the list seems to get longer. So I have a question for you guys here. According to you, how severe are those infections in puppies? How severe are those infection caused by the pathogens I just mentioned in puppies. Do you think they are severe? Do you think they are mild infections? Do you think they are totally asymptomatic? Or do you have no idea? So what do you think? Okay, okay, so five, Four, two, three, two, one. Okay, so 50% of you said I have no idea, and that's great because I have the answer for you guys. The papers I mentioned and others we looked into when we prepared this presentation, you know, 
tell us the following. Some of those viruses that we just mentioned, they were associated with acute hemorrhagic diarrhea, lethargy and death in puppies. Acute hemorrhagic diarrhea, lethargy and death. Very similar to what is observed in cases of parvo infection. And that really reinforces the fact that clinical signs alone are never enough to reach a diagnosis in those situations, clearly. But there's more to that as well. Do you think those pathogens are frequent in canines? Do you think those pathogens I described, those astrovirus, circovirus, uh, norovirus, are they frequent in canines? Yes, no, I have no idea. What do you think? Because we don't hear about them really often. Well, most of the, t most of the time we, we don't hear about them in veterinary clinics these days. Okay, so four, five, three, two, one. Okie dokie. So most of you say, I have no idea. And some of you say, yes, they are frequent. So again, let's take a look at the literature. Because now we have quite a few studies that are describing those pathogens. Uh, oh, the charts are still moving. That's exciting. But anyway, let's move to, to the studies. You see this study here, novel, novel norovirus in dogs with diarrhea from 2010 in a journal called Emerging Infectious Disease. In this study, they detected norovirus in 40% of diarrheic dogs. 40%. That's a lot. That's a lot when it comes to a population. And same here. In, on this study from Germany on the prevalence of dog circovirus in healthy and diarrheic dogs. So you see, in this study, they identified that 20.1% of dogs with diarrhea were shedding the canine circovirus. 20.1, again, is a huge number when it comes to a canine population. And here as well, publication from 2012, prevalent and risk factors of astrovirus infections in puppies from French breeding kennels. 20.1% of those puppies were shedding the canine astrovirus. So, and I can even add to that, there was one study I found on the canine Kobe virus that I just mentioned a little bit earlier, and it was reported in 50.5% of diarrheic dogs from a shelter. So you see, uh, those pathogens are common, and they've been identified worldwide. It's not specific to a country. Today we know that they circulate amongst canines. So to sum up, they are, those pathogens I described are potentially associated with severe clinical signs. As I said, very similar to what we find in the parvo infection. They are definitely frequent, and they circulate amongst canines. So the good news is, for instance, for the canine circovirus, now we have PCR panels, digestive PCR panels, that are looking for the canine circovirus. But for the others, the canine astrovirus, the canine norovirus, the canine cobivirus, the sapovirus, the bocavirus, we don't look for them yet. So you see, that's why we wanted to tell you about them today, because we believe that they should always be considered as potential threat in breeding kennels. And that being said, guys, keep in mind that there are still lots of question marks regarding the way those viruses and those uh, protozoa cause gastroenteritis in puppies. All the viruses I mentioned, they are indeed frequently uh, found in dogs and puppies with diarrhea. And it has been proven that they can lead to severe clinical signs. All the reports I showed you, that's what they describe. But we also know that they can also be found in healthy individuals. And that's quite confusing, right? It reminds us of something important too, I guess, with, which, by the way, is true for all digestive pathogens. It's not only about the result of the test. It is also about the way the test is interpreted. So that's another good reason, in my opinion, for you guys to work in close partnership with your veterinarian. So today, it is not really clear why those pathogens, especially those viruses, would cause a severe disease in certain puppies and not in others. So uh, those viruses alone can induce 
those clinical signs we mentioned, again, like a parvo infection. And that's what those reports we mentioned told us. But it has also been evident that the more severe clinical expressions also happen in case of what we call co-infection with other digestive pathogens. So it's a kind of an association of bad guys working together. It is especially well described now in the case of the canine circovirus, which is more and more you know, considered as uh, what we call a negative cofactor in the disease outcome in case of canine parvo infection. So canine parvo plus canine circovirus all together, together is a very serious threat. And the same might be true maybe for um, all the kind of associations between viruses and protozoa as well. We don't know yet. So definitely the coming years will tell us much more about the role they play in the development and the severity of GI disorders observed in puppies at weaning. But that being said, remember what we said before, guys. When we want to prevent infectious diseases in kennels, when you want to prevent infectious diseases in kennels, we need to focus on two things. The medical prophylaxis, but in these situations, it's not going to be simple, clearly, because there's no vaccine yet for those pathogens. Absolutely no medical prophylaxis we could follow to prevent them from causing clinical issues in, in the kennel. So it comes back to what we said. It, come back to, it comes back to your main priority, sanitation. That must be your top priority in kennels. So our three virtual breeders, uh, they do have in place a two-step two sanitation protocol. They clean first with a good soap, a good degreaser, and then they disinfect with a disinfectant. And that's very, very important. And take, let's take a look at their disinfection protocol. So you see our Rottweiler breeder. After cleaning, she uses a product that contains something called benzalkonium chloride. That's a fantastic word. I really encourage you to learn it by heart and uh, try to mention it at dinner time. You sound very smart. But you see, she uses this product on the floor, and she lets it sit for 10 minutes, and then she rinses. That's how she does her disinfection in her kennel. Keep that in mind. So our Yorkie breeder uses bleach. And he uses bleach at the dilution of 1 to 10. He puts one volume of bleach for 10 volumes of water. And again, he lets it sit roughly for one minute, and then he rinses it. That is disinfection protocol. And let's see what our Brittany Spaniel breeder does. He uses something called, that contains hydrogen peroxide. He lets it sit for 10 minutes, but it doesn't rinse. And as soon as the 10 minutes are over, he reintroduces the dogs and the puppies inside the, inside the room. He just, clean, he just disinfected with the product. Three different protocols. Tell me, guys, which one of our three breeders uses a disinfectant that could be recommended in their situation, which is, again, diarrhea in their puppies, they did some tests, they didn't find anything. All the most common pathogens, it was negative for all the most common pathogens. So which one of them do you think uses the right disinfectant? Remember, the Rottweiler breeder is using a product called benzalkonium chloride. The Yorkie breeder is using bleach. The Brittany Spaniel breeder is using hydrogen peroxide. And uh, maybe none of them are using the correct product. So tell me, guys, what do you think? Okay, so four, no, four, <laughs> five, four, three, two, one, great. So 50% uh, of you said that none of them are using the correct disinfectant. But in fact, we have a winner here. The Yorkie breeder indeed is using the right disinfectant. Remember, the Yorkie breeder is using bleach. And uh, why is he using the right disinfectant in this situation? So something to remember about all the viruses, all those new viruses, the canine norovirus, the canine astrovirus, the canine circovirus, and all the others, all of them I just mentioned, almost all of them are new viruses, like our canine parvovirus. And again, we don't have tests yet to identify them all in routine. However, if they are new viruses, 
it is definitely important to prioritize the use of the disinfectant that is efficient on such pathogens. So the most common disinfectant you find usually at a local department store or at a grocery store are the, what we call the quaternary ammoniums or quats. Uh, typically, when you look at the, the active compound, it contains ammonium something in its name. You will find hydrogen peroxides. You will find alcohols. Uh, typically, in the, uh, the products containing alcohol, uh, the active compound will contain uh, something uh, all, O-L. So those are described, those products, those disinfectants that are commonly found, they are described in the veterinary literature as not being fully effective against new viruses. And they are currently not recommended as first-line disinfectant in structures like breeding kennels. So you see our Rottweiler breeder, she was using benzalkonium chloride. That's a quaternary ammonium. Not efficient, not fully efficient on new viruses. The Yorkie breeder, the, um, uh, the Britain Spaniel breeder, was using hydrogen peroxide. Not efficient on new viruses. So when it comes to new viruses, Bleach definitely remains a great alternative. Over the year, this is still a very good alternative to consider when it comes to prevention of infection induced by new viruses. Other options you can look into are this one, potassium peroxymonosulfate, to use frequently in kennels, or even better, this one here, AHPs. Those stands for accelerated hydrogen peroxide. They usually, in fact, carry the, the sign AHP right on the bottle. Those, they have become the norm in human hospitals, and they are used more and more in kennels, shelters, veterinary facilities. They are definitely different from the classic hydrogen peroxide we find in grocery stores, and typically AHPs, they, are, they can only be sold to professionals. So you see, that's about the product, but it's never only about the product when it comes to sanitation. Which one of our three breeders is using the disinfectant properly here. So remember, the Rottweiler breeder, she lets its disinfectant sit for 10 minutes and then she rinses. The Yorkie breeder dilutes its bleach for at one to 10 and then rinses after one minute of contact time on the ground. While the Britain Spaniel breeder uses hydrogen peroxide, he lets it sit for 10 minutes, but he doesn't rinse. So which of them is using the right protocol here? Okay, so five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and good job. Most of you answered that the Rottweiler breeder is the one who is doing the right job, and that's indeed the case. Uh, she's, not, she's using quaternary ammonium, so those are not efficient on uh, the new viruses, but she's using the quaternary ammoniums correctly. She lets it sit for 10 minutes, and then she rinses. it. Uh, and that's very, very important. Again, it's not only about the product you're using. It's also about the way you're using the product. And when it comes to sanitation, the, when it comes to disinfection, there are always a few things to keep in mind. First, the dilution. Let's take the example of bleach. Bleach needs to be used at a dilution of 1 to 32 of the 5% bleach solution when you want to fight new viruses. So the 5% bleach solution that I mentioned at the end of my sentence is very, very important because today many bleach solutions that are sold at, gro at, at the grocery store especially, they are below 5%. So if you are interested uh, in the notes, I will share with you guys a bleach dilution calculator that I got from Shelter Medicine. And that really comes in handy when it comes to defining the proper dilution of the bleach you're using. And that's important because if it's too diluted, it's not going to be efficient. If it's not diluted enough, is going to be very corrosive for the materials in your kennel and the fumes that comes from the product can potentially affect the dogs, the puppies, and can lead to in an increase in, upper resp in uh, respiratory problems. So dilution is really key when it comes to uh, disinfection protocol. And the contact time also is something very, very important we need to focus on. No doubt about that. Remember that uh, when it comes to bleach, Bleach needs to sit for 10 minutes and then needs to be rinsed to be efficient. 
if you don't follow the protocol entirely, it's not going to be effective. And I visited many kennels where uh, they use bleach, but they don't let bleach sit for 10 minutes. It's one minute and then they rinse, or it's one minute and then they don't even rinse. So the 10 minute contact time is essential. And this is where you see AHPs, those accelerated hydrogen peroxides, are very interesting because they are very effective on new viruses and they have a reduced contact time, typically one to five minutes, which obviously definitely increases compliance because it's easier to wait one minute than 10 minutes. Well, those products are clearly more expensive, but they do bring very interesting features to the table here. And the last one we need to think of is rinsing. So rinsing, uh, bleach for instance, will require rinsing. And I really encourage you to rinse after using bleach because if you don't rinse, well, when the dogs will walk on the bleach, it will irritate their paws. Uh, some of the puppies might start licking the bleach and that will irritate their digestive tract and it typically leads to, to vomiting as well. So but that's why with bleach, rinsing is always required. But it's not recommended, for instance, it's not mandatory when you use potassium peroxy monosulfate, for instance. Um, it's not also something required when you use AHPs. So you see, that was just a quick reminder that it's not only about the product you're using when it comes to sanitation, it's also about the way you're using it. Because our tree breeders here, they believe they are doing the right thing However, as you understand now, none of them is properly disinfecting the environment and none of them is proactively preventing those diseases. So don't hesitate to, to give some thoughts to your sanitation protocol to make sure it is fully adapted to your challenges because remember, in, in breeding kennels, this is your top priority. So you see those three liters of puppies we've been following since the beginning of this webinar, they might indeed be infected by one of those specific pathogens we don't test for yet. That's clearly a possibility. But in conjunction to that, it is not impossible that there is something else that contributes to the occurrence and to the severity of the disease. And this something else could be what we call dysbiosis. To make it super short, dysbiosis means microbial in disbalance microbial imbalance. So you know that on our skin, on our in our digestive tract, we carry germs, we carry microbes, bacteria, and they live in harmony with us. So when this harmony is broken, this is when we see dysbiosis arising. A quick question for you guys, by the way, how many bacteria can we find in the digestive tract of our dogs? 10 to the power of 3, 10 to the power of 6, 10 to the power of 9, or 10 to the power of 14. That's the Wikipedia moment of the presentation. Okay, so most of you said 10 to the power of 9, and in fact, guys, the correct answer here is 10 to the power of 14. To put things into perspective, that is more than 10 times the total number of cells in a mammalian organism, 10 times more cells than in a dog, in a human, in a cat, etc. That tells you that the guts, the, back, the, the digestive tract, is overcrowded. And those bacteria, why are they so important? Because those organisms, today we refer to them as something we call the microbiome, and uh, more and more, I see publication mentioning that the microbiome is considered somehow as an organ. But those organisms, they enhance and balance immunity. They help eliminate pathogens. They also assist in the digestion. They convert ingested materials in other helpful compounds. Their role is preponderant. And it has been highlighted more and more these recent years, especially in human medicine. What we know, a healthy dog's microbiome is vastly different from a sick one. So the main difference is the loss of diversity in the bacterial, bacterial population it is made of. So understand that the bacterial population of a sick dog is way different from one that is healthy. And intestinal dysbiosis, so modification of the bacterial flora of the digestive tract, is associated with acute gastrointestinal disorders, like what we observed in puppies at weaning. 
So according to you, what has an impact on the development of the puppy's microbiome? Do you think parturition plays a role in the development of the puppy's microbiome? Do you think colostrum intake plays a role? Do you think stress plays a role? Do you think medical treatments the puppy might receive during his lifetime can impact the development of the microbiome? Tell me, what do you think? What can impact the puppy's microbiome? Okay, so many different answers. Most of you said colostrum intake, and indeed colostrum intake will have an influence on uh, the development of the puppy's microbiome. But to tell you the truth, guys, the right answer here is all of the above. All those potential factors have an impact on the puppy's microbiome. What we know today, the microbiome of the puppies is derived from their mothers. So, however, in canines, there are still many question marks. Uh, we don't know yet how this transfer between the mother's microbiome and the puppy's microbiome mainly happens. Does it happen during gestation? Is it during parturition when puppies are going through the birth canal? Is it after parturition when their mother is licking them? It could even be, you know, a combination of all. We simply don't know for sure yet. In humans, however, we know that babies born, for instance, by C-section, have a very different microbiome than those born naturally. And that has an impact on the development of their immune system. Some of those kids that were born by C-section, uh, they are therefore more predisposed to develop allergies. We don't know if the same is true in puppies, but that finding in human medicine really emphasizes how important this microbiome is. And we know that again, the offspring inherits the maternal microbiome. And typically in humans, the composition of the, 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 the baby microbiome, of the kid microbiome, it will normalize to that of the mother later in life, typically during adolescence. In puppies, we simply don't know yet when this normalization occurs. Again, some details we still need to understand. But you see these emerging epidemiological data from human medicine and our evolving understanding of the role of the gut microbiome suggests that proper diagnosis and correction of dysbiosis will be an important therapeutic goal in various diseases. And it seems to us that this is something very important to focus on as well in puppies suffering from weaning diarrhea. So that's why we wanted to share with you some do's and don't do's that you need to keep in mind when it comes to, again, protecting and optimizing somehow the puppy microbiome. And the first thing has to do with antibiotic treatment because Dr. Kessler and I, we work with many breeders like you guys, and very often in the canine breeding world, antibiotics are still believed to be the solution to everything. In the previous dog breeder webinar we did, we mentioned why they might not always be so helpful uh, in many cases related to infertility. And we believe they should also be used in caution when it comes to, to weeding puppies. Because in humans, antibiotic-induced dysbiosis in early childhood is one of the most important risk factors for the development of allergies, obesity, and inflammatory bowel disease. So in dogs, it has been shown that antibiotic administration, antibiotics such as metronidazole, which I'm sure you guys all have heard of, when you administrate those antibiotics to healthy dogs, this induces a, ma a major dysbiosis. We, uh, and uh, and, and that can have critical consequences, especially in a newborn, in, in, a, in a puppy at winning. So don't get me wrong here. There are cases where antibiotic treatment will be required. However, I think it is really important to point out that antibiotics today, we know for sure that they are not the solution to everything. And sometimes people are using them as uh, therapeutic, well, uh, as medical prophylaxis. And we think that they should be used cautiously in breeding kennel. They shouldn't be a first-line treatment, as, still, as it still seems to be too often the case. So beware of blind antibiotic treatments in, in winning puppies. We've seen this a lot, and we know today that it can lead to major consequences, and it has a major impact on the puppy's microbiome. 
Nutrition will also play a role in the development of the digestive microbiome. That's, that's a certainty. And therefore, the way nutritional weaning is conducted will always be something important to consider for you guys. So the first thing is obviously about the diet. The diet you pick to conduct nutritional weaning is critical. Think highly digestible proteins, for instance, something we call uh, leap proteins. Think beef pulp, think psyllium, prebiotics. Uh, sodium silicone aluminate. All those nutrients are known to, to participate to the puppy's digestive health. And at this stage, uh, beware of supplements. The most common mistake we see is that breeders give, they, they pick a diet which, uh, which is optimized in terms of digestive safety uh, for the weaning. But on top of that, they add things like probiotics, prebiotics, psyllium seeds, pumpkin, etc., etc. So don't get me wrong, all those nutrients, uh, they are indeed described as having digestive benefits. But when you add them on top of a diet that is already optimized in terms of digestive health in healthy puppies, well, there's definitely room to upset the digestive microbiome here. And one thing I learned about nutrition over the years, uh, the more is not always the merrier. It's all about balance. Over-supplementing, which is Something we, still, we see in kennels can have side effects. When you over-supplement a puppy that has no problem, it can upset his digestive microbiome. So unless told otherwise by your veterinarian, in clinical cases, when there are clinical symptoms, when the puppies are healthy, when you start the weaning process, there is no need to supplement in first intention when the, the diet is already balanced. But here again, uh, there's more to it. It's not only about the diet. When it comes to nutrition, you always need to answer those three questions. Uh, which diet, how, how much, and how you're using the diet. So along the same lines, make sure you're not overfeeding your puppies at the time of weaning. Make sure you're controlling the, the amount of food you're giving them because feeding too much will simply overload the digestive, their digestive capacities. And this can lead to diarrhea as well. So you've seen the picture with the Rottweiler puppies at the beginning with the, the, this Winafida. That's a great tool to use to help regulate food ingestion and decrease food competition when you start weaning the puppies. And if you use that, uh, and I think on top of that, one of the top feeding practices to integrate in your kennel these days is the use of a gram scale. Uh, sure, it will take you more time, maybe a couple minutes more per day to weigh the amount of food you're feeding your puppies. However, I really believe this is a great investment of your time when it comes to preventing diarrhea in puppies. Remember, if they eat too much, their digestive capacity will be overloaded, and that can lead to development of diarrhea of overconsumption. And one key word to remember when it comes to weaning, to nutritional weaning, it must be progressive. Key elements to remember here. Do not start nutritional weaning before the puppies are four weeks, four weeks and a half. Humidify the food at the beginning of the process. That will facilitate ingestion and digestion. And typically, we would recommend to conduct nutritional weaning over four weeks. And every week, you will decrease the water content that you use to, to prepare the kibbles, to humidify the kibbles, so that at the end of the process, at the end of the four weeks, puppies only eat solid food. So you see, typically, this is the ratio we would recommend uh, on the first week. So on the first week, you will use one volume of kibble for two volumes of water. On the second week of the, of the weaning process, it will be a one-to-one, -one, one volume of kibble for one volume of water. On the third week, one to, uh, this is the ratio, one volume of kibble for 0.5 volume of water so that on the fourth week, those puppies are only eating dry food. And there's one last thing I wanted to mention to you guys. More and more, you know, when the microbiome is upset, we hear about the use of fecal transplants. And this is something that has been proposed in puppies suffering from weaning diarrhea as well. You can see the paper where it is mentioned here. So the concept is really quite simple. You prepare a solution containing what is considered to be a healthy microbiome typically uh, the mother's poop that you mix with saline. And you give this to the puppy, typically ovally. It's kind of feeding them with a, a poop shake, <laughs> if we can call it this way, but it's kind of gross, I agree. 
But the theory is that this way, it will help you normalize the microbiome of those puppies suffering from gastroenteritis. So uh, this study I found, uh, typically uh, the results basically tell us that we still need to have a better understanding of the puppy's microbiome to come up with the right protocol. But however, this is certainly an alternative, a therapeutic alternative veterinarians will look, in, will look into more and more in the future. So every day, you see, research tells us that there are more and more digestive pathogens that can pot potentially be involved in causing weaning diarrhea in puppies. Every day, research tells us more and more about the role of the microbiome. So agreed, there are still lots of things to learn, but we already understand that these factors might play an important role when it comes to weaning diarrhea. And as breeders, we believe that you definitely need to take them into account. So you need to focus on what you know. Sanitation, how to properly use nutrition. Those are things you can already use in terms of prevention. And remember, beware of blind antibiotic treatment. Really, guys, and this is something we see a lot, so please don't do that. Things like fecal transplants are still just anecdotes, but we foresee that they might become an interesting therapeutic alternative in the future, even when it comes to winning diarrhea in puppies, for sure. As you understood during this webinar, Winning diarrhea is a syndrome, and undoubtedly a complex one. The solution is never simple, because we have to consider many different aspects. However, if you focus on what we discussed today, I have no doubt that you guys will be better prepared to face it. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, of cure, and I think there is no more important say for you guys dog breeders. And this is the end. So thank you guys for taking part in this interactive discussion. You know, as usual, it, it has been a great pleasure. It was a great pleasure to spend the last hour and 13 minutes in your company online. Uh, you know how to say, the webinar might end here, but the discussion never stops. If you have questions now, you can post them on our chat, and we will do a quick Q&A in a few seconds. But again, if later today or in the coming days you wake up and you think, hey, I should have asked them this, feel free to reach out to Dr. Kessler and myself. We'll always be happy to answer your questions if we can. Also, don't forget to fill in the satisfaction survey that will pop up on your computer or tablet when you leave the virtual conference room. You know that your comments definitely help us improve our future webinars. We believe that those are, are great tools that can help our breeder community. And your feedback will definitely help us make them even better in the future. I hope we will see you again soon. Uh, again, uh, we create the content, but you are definitely the ones who bring those webinar sessions to life. And I can tell you that Dr. Kessler and I, whatever technical difficulties we might bump into, uh, we really enjoy those online moments in your company. So I hope we will see each other very soon, maybe during one of our live presentations, maybe during the next webinar, who knows? The next one is already scheduled, write down the date, Tuesday, June the 13th. We will discuss what we learned during the International Working Dog Breeding Association. That happened, this is a conference that happens in two weeks in Banff, Canada. Uh, we'll be there, we'll take a lot of notes, and we'll share it with you guys uh, in June on the, during uh, uh, one of these online sessions. So that's all, folks, for today. See you soon, guys, for more online adventures.